So tonight I'm excited, uh, my friends, because um, I'm going to be able to have a conversation with my friend Daniel Nairi. And uh, let me give you some formal uh, information about Daniel. And I've had to write this down because I'm hardly ever formal with Daniel. But anyway, Daniel is a writer and he's written two books, uh, one of which we'll be discussing tonight, Everything Sad is Untrue. And the other is called uh, Straw House, Woodhouse, Brick House Below. If you don't know about that book, you should also purchase it and put it on the, uh, the shelf alongside Everything Sad is Untrue. But he's also an editor and publisher with Odd Dot Publishing, which is um, part of Macmillan Children's Publishing, uh, part of their work that's going on there. Daniel is part of a really fascinating team. I've followed them lightly over the years uh, that and the time that they've been in Odd Dot, and there are really some cool people there because, you know, Daniel only wants really good people around him. Anyway, so enough of the formal stuff. The informal stuff is that uh, Daniel is somebody I met when he was a student at NYU and uh, when I was working in ministry there and he was a friend of a couple of other NYU students that I knew and we just became uh, friends uh, in that time which uh, I very much cherished. He is also a husband and father and uh, when he, I met him in New York City uh, there was um, there was a little bit of an angst in him. That angst has never left, but you, you can pick some of that up in his book and everything sad is untrue, but it was never, never the kind of angst, angst that I never felt like I was not being engaged and enjoyed really connecting with him. But anyway, um, welcome. This was supposed to be a formal introduction. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not in my bio. That was my first impression of you, Daniel. I don't know. What was your first impression of me? Golly, that's we a met good on question. The street. It was huh? on the street. We met on the street, I think. We ran into yes. uh, Well, we I, met we met on the street, I believe, on the way to uh the uh what's it called? The bakery, right? That was Yes. I think I that's think how I met you. So this there was a there was a period of time where there was sort of this program trying to connect younger artists at the time I was an undergrad with, mm -hmm. with sort of uh, older artists. I thought you were running the thing. Like you, you, so I, for I the longest anything. time, I had no idea. <laughs> I'll tell you, my first impression of you was being like, that Kirk guy runs a lot of programs. And <laughs> it turns out you, you also, you were just a connector. I mean, you, you were a lot of things, but you were very mm -hmm. much a connector of people. And so every time I would go to a different program, you would be there and I would just naturally associate it with you. Um, oh, so I appreciate that. Sure. Even well, though I had not, nothing to do with very little of that, but I was uh, humbled to be used in that. Time. I actually take it now. I mean, looking back, I've never had to answer this question, right? But uh, looking back, I realized it was because you, you sort of naturally uh, took on the role of the host and, and you know, ended up welcoming people to whatever it was. Uh, you know, and yeah. in my head, I always imagined, I was like, oh, wow. I guess he runs the place. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I That's why I was so mad. I was always complaining to the manager. That's what I was really doing. I was trying to. Oh, the manager. Yeah, I was just like, Kirk, why are you running? Yeah. This city is busted, Kirk. And I've got some complaints. Would you mind? <laughs> if only I had as much power as Rudy did in that day. <laughs> anyway, OK, let me jump into the book here uh, with okay. everything sad is untrue. A formal uh, here's introduction, my first if question. you please. Yes. yes, a true story. Here's my first question. Yeah. Why are you so hard on poets? <laughs> why are you so hard on artists? Transigent poets. Uh, why am I so hard on well, poets? You, you, you go beyond, you start with Pers all Persians are liars, which is an amazing first line. But then you throw poets in there like a paragraph or two and you talk about how they're worse. And, yep. then, and then later you talk about a sculptor. Now I know you're kind of talking about yourself too. Uh, yeah. Just an aside, everybody needs to know when Daniel and I uh, worked together in the city. He was kind of the student official, unofficial poet laureate of the stuff that we did. So I'm asking him why he's so hard on himself. <laughs> I am very hard on artists. I, I actually think, I think, um, here's why. I think um, as we have balkanized skill sets, right? So as, as in the, so in the past, a poet would also have to know how to make chairs or whatever, would have to have other skills. And in fact, like in the same way that if you wanted music in your life, and I say past, like, I mean, before recorded music, you would have to learn how to play music. Like you, you literally, and, and so uh, grandpa who was 
you know, a farmer and grandma who, um, you know, was uh, had, a, had a dozen skills and could, could do all these things um, would then also gain sort of, as art became a profession, there was an interesting couple of things happened in my opinion. Um, at first it became a profession and it was very clear that it had what I would call hunger. Hunger is the skill when I hire at Odd Dot, um, I actually, I don't care if you're awesome. I don't care which kind of person you are. I can, there's only one quality that the, the team, when they're bringing new people in, um, they, know, they know how to get my attention. They're like, this person's hungry. And I'm like, that, that's it, that's what I want. And I have, a, I have a whole ethos in my head anyway, about what I consider what hungry means. Um, but the initial artists were hungry to justify their profession as a standalone profession. Right, they were hungry in that way to, um, in some ways, uh, make it feel as necessary as as everything else. Now, as as you get you get further, certainly you get into the era where I enter the the sort of the workforce. Um, you enter a space where writers are mostly just talking to writers. Um, they're the ones who spend all day spilling a whole bunch of ink, and electricians aren't. And electricians aren't also then taking up writing. Mm -hmm. uh, in the evenings, they're too busy. And they're also not really reading the work of writers uh, as much. The average American reads six books. The, by the way, the average American reads six books a year. Um, and it's, and I, if, I, I forget, if you take out like certain uh, specific titles, I'll, I'll, I'll have to go into the stats for you. Uh, it's even less. If you read 17 books a year, um, which probably a lot of people in this room do, you, uh, you know, you get in the arts groups, you get a lot of, you know, um, super readers. Um, you're in the top five percentile. That's wow. a 17. I mean, that's that's a, a scary statistic, which tells me writers are only reading writers. Yeah. And so as a result, what happens then is what I call the sort of the endless uh, self-valorization of art. Hmm. Um, I, you know, you walk into any, and I spend a lot of time in the book world. I am, you know, that's my every day. And you spend a lot of time talking to a lot of people who, have never once in their minds questioned um, the value of art, and I and I certainly have I have questioned it, and I've come to find that it is extremely and deeply and intrinsically valuable. So don't don't think I'm here to knock on it. But no, what I'm saying is um, the 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 Kool Aid being served is how could anyone think anything else? We're we're only ever talking to each other about how books can save lives. That's all we ever do. Nobody, I've never been in a conversation where it's like, oh, hey, everybody, books are so powerful, and I believe this, that they can save lives, and I believe that. Yeah. At no point has anyone said, and also, that power can be used to ruin lives. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, and books ruin lives has never been a bumper sticker. <laughs> uh, so I think that in order to, in order to properly respect poetry, in order, and I think this way, by the way, about the profession of teaching. In order to properly respect teaching and its difficulty, we cannot say every teacher is the hero of the world. We have to say it's so hard that there are some awful teachers out there. <laughs> and, and poetry is so difficult and so worthwhile that there are some really, uh, there are some that, that are uh, 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 very poor at it. Yeah. Um, and so, and so to, uh, to go back, why do I, yeah, to me, the standard is, um, should be kept very high and it should be considered, um, you know, difficult and it should be, um, and it should always be, uh, we should always be questioning the necessity of it in the same way that I sit in the waiting room of a dentist's office and go, get so mad that 30 minutes later, I'm like, do I, should dentists exist? And of course the answer immediately in my jaw is, yeah, they should totally exist. This one just is making me wait 30 minutes. And so <laughs> I, I want that same feeling. I want this like constant assessment, constant scrutiny um, for every artist and every art form of like, should this exist? Should this, should this be around? Are we, what is this doing? Um, and for me, the great art, is like the answers are so clearly obvious. It's the difference between, uh, you know, sitting in the waiting room of a dentist in sh shrieking pain and walking out, you know, um, relieved. Uh, so yeah, that's why. Is that, so you, that... you basically told me that you wanted to 
you're doing that because you're being the drill sergeant to all the other artists that get in their no, face. I don't say, I would never take, no, I don't take that no, position. No, I take it from my own head. Yeah, sure. For well, myself. Because yourself, because you want yourself, you want to be the best writer or the best poet you can be. And you'd like to invite those around to be that if they can. Yeah, it's really hard to, it's really hard not to just be writing a poem, especially a formal poem or even a book. It's so hard. Like for me, again, this is all for Daniel, right? Like, I don't know what anybody's doing and I don't police anybody else's life. So like they can do anything they like and God bless them. And I hope they thrive. But I'm talking about this, the ways in which the methods I have come to survive what is otherwise a very difficult and unsurvivable scenario uh, is this, is it's so easy. It's so difficult to write a uh, poem that it is extremely easy to finish and be awfully proud of yourself mm. uh, and as a result be done and and this is this is unacceptable because that at that moment what you have just said is my first draft is my last draft I'm I'm finished the moment I have completed it and you're like well no 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 <laughs> you've completed it it's now there's a beginning middle and an end mm. now you should be embarrassed and now you should you should begin the work of like um, auditing it in such a way as to um, make it great, right? Yeah. So it's as it's very it is. I, I have there's so many times where I'll go back and speak. Wow, I was just so proud just to have made it through the slog and have finished what can be deciphered as a sonnet. Like this, yeah. someone else could look at this and just say, "That's a sonnet." Mm -hmm. um, and and in order not to do that, that's so I, I would never say the drill sergeant of the world, but I would say certainly the my own my own um yeah absolutely and you know another way to put it is like art is do you remember when i was in college i i was very i was very worried about this i was very worried that like i would inflict um a sort of a frivolous and self uh interested mission um of becoming an artist on my you know otherwise innocent family Right, I would become basically the sort of father who dragged his children around. I was neither a husband nor a father. I was like an eighteen-year-old with worries, but you know, I worried that I would drag my children along, and that someday they would they would become twelve, and realize that the the material um, disadvantages in their life were due entirely to the fact that I wasn't a good enough writer, um, and so. And so as a result, I became very worried about um, what I considered a very selfish decision. So I, I went during those four summer, summer months, uh, sorry, the four summer breaks in college. And I, I said, all right, here's what I'll do. I will allow myself to major in poetry, but each summer I will take the, uh, the worst job I can think of, like quite literally the worst that no one could possibly want and prove that if I could do it, then I could always have this backstop. I could always say, all right, I've graduated uh, uh, like with the trifling <laughs> degree of poetry and religious studies, but worst comes to worst, I can dig ditches in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and so and uh which is in 112 degree heat uh and and so it's like all right well if i can do that or I, you know for the second summer i was a um itinerant construction worker i was these guys these guys who sort of we, I, we would line up in front of the home depot at 6 a.m mm -hmm. uh and these trucks would come by it was me and a, and a lot of other um immigrants and uh they they would just come in trucks and they would kind of look at you and be like you look like you can lift for a day and so they would literally just you know wave at us they would drive this was in southern california um i would jump in the back of the truck and we would they would drive us up the hill so this was at the bottom of the hill where basically like the poorer part of town they would drive us up the hill into what is generally known as beverly hills and um we'd work on a this like just big old mansion all day and then by the end of the day they'd give us cash and I'd walk back home. Um, that was a really, really difficult job. Uh, it was a job where people threw food at you all the time, uh, and it, you know, and it would it would sort of break your spirit. It was the kind of job that we very clearly did that. Um, and and so each summer I ended up taking a, a worse and worse job. Um, 
And then during the, you know, because during the other nine months, I was in the library of the, in the second largest library in the United States, like wandering the stacks, reading about oh, well, anything, you know, whatever. It's like, it was sort of, you had to pay for it. I had no idea you did that during the summers. In fact, <laughs> thinking back, I don't, I don't remember seeing you during the summers. And so now I know why. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Gosh, even I'm learning something. All right. So I have to ask this of you. Sure. Who are, who are the poets you're reading? Are you reading any poets right now? Or who, who do you? Well, I'm lucky enough to work at the house that publishes Louise Gluck, who okay. today won the Nobel prize. Really? Uh, in literature. Yeah. So, um, oh. I, uh, I just ordered, <laughs> I ordered up, um, I've read her work before in snippets, but, um, I, you know, are the publisher, his name is Jonathan Galassi. He's the publisher at, um, FSG for Far Strauss Giroux is the mm -hmm. imprint here, and um, they just put out a big old like uh, congratulations. Of course, she deserves it, and I am I'm sort of catching up to to that now. Um, yeah. Well, that's news to me, and I I, I don't think I've read any Louise Gluck, so I, I blame out. you a little bit because you you've put me onto some good poets, but <laughs> as far as it'll go at this point. Yeah, I guess I guess once uh, you win the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, sorry, Nobel Prize for Literature, you know, then then you can land on our radars. No, we I, we should I should have given her name to you a long time ago, but uh, I've it seen is... it. It could have been me. <laughs> could have been me. So so um, um, that, that's a great one. All right, so here's here's my next. So um, I asked you about poets and artists, but um, how you kind of mention this in in reading and how to be a better artist so we got a little bit of this about how you see the arts fitting into our the general culture of our own communities and neighborhoods and whatnot but i wondered if you'd want to flesh that out a little more i mean you talked about um at least where you are uh, writers talk to other writers and you seem to say something about lamenting the fact that they're not talking to the electricians or, or whatnot. But uh, so I would say you seem to say that there's, there's value beyond the arts in and of itself as it is practiced in the humanity and the communities that people live in, actually live in. Even if they're going to Home Depot and getting a job and jumping in the back of a truck and going up the hill. Yeah. that the arts is still valuable to them. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? I wonder if you well, I want that. the arts to be valuable to them. The, the arts I value are the arts that are valuable to them, you know? So yeah. like the, the more I, um, and, and granted, I, this is coming from a writer, right? So maybe at a electrician's conference or any conference, I don't know why I've chosen that. I, you know why I chose electricians? Because uh, the lighting in here is terrible when I need one. <laughs> but uh, the, so that's the only reason that name comes up. I don't have any associations there, but I, I bet, uh, you know, maybe at a, their conferences, they, they sit around and talk about how like, we, we should probably be reading more than six books a year or whatever, right? So I don't, all I'm saying is, you know, where I put the blame is on my tribe in some ways. And I do, I put the blame of not being relevant to the, to the needs of the spirit of the people uh, with whom we live. Mm -hmm. I put that failing on the shoulders of the, of the artist, on the shoulder of the writer. Um, and as a result, uh, then reassess based on that. So that is an assumption I build into this conversation. You certainly do not have to build with that assumption. But if you do, then you start to say to yourself, why is, um, what, what makes art necessary? Necess the, the, the nature of like, you know, we'll say, we'll talk about large concepts like mm -hmm. beauty or truth. Right. Um, or, uh, or even sometimes we will we'll say, you know, we will build on the nature of like, um, you know, what, what the romantics would call like sublimity, right? Like this, um, or, or even just like, you know, nature, nature as you know, however, the many ways we can define it. Mm -hmm. I end up taking the word necessity and really valuing it, really as passing a lot of um, the art um, through that, through that lens, right? And, and that, there's a large range of what what is you know necessary um mm -hmm. but um but here's a good example you're if a loved one of yours heaven forbid 
uh, passes, passes at their own hand. Uh, and and you, have, you have a few days um, to figure out what to say. <laughs> you know, there is, uh, there are some people who are so articulate and have the wherewithal and the capability at that moment of like extreme pain, extreme confusion, extreme damage to be able to just articulate extemporaneously how they feel to the people around them. Mm -hmm. This mixture of why and, and anger and uh, uh, desperation and sadness, all these things. It's just a stew of mixed and, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, contradictory feelings. Um, some people can do it. And God, those, are, those people are geniuses. Most of us reach for something. Most of us reach for a metaphor, for an example, for a story, for like, I don't know, for a book on how to give eulogies. Like we literally reach for these things. We need them. We need like explanation and um, solace. And, um, and that, that is a fascinating moment for me. That is a moment where it is undeniable that this human being needs art and they need it. Um, more, more than they need anything else. Like they, they won't get sleep, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, often they won't eat. They need, so, so somewhere in this like hierarchy of needs comes this like, I am faced with the void and I need someone else's explanation of this scenario to then relay to my, my family. Yeah. Um, that happens all the time. That, that, that example is extreme. But it happens at like Wednesdays when you're exhausted and you hate your job and you go like, I don't know, click on Netflix and whatever. Like that, that, that happens. It art happens all the time. Like, you know, my, one of my favorite tweets for the pandemic was like, yeah, for all these people who think the arts aren't necessary, um, let me know how you're going to survive the pandemic without reading anything, watching anything, listening to anything. <laughs> or, or like, and you're like, mm, yeah, good yeah. point. Good yeah. point. Uh, we're all, you know, um, experiencing a, a sudden necessity of more art, um, yeah. especially good art, right? So then that aspect of it, the, what I would consider the mechanical aspect, like the aspect, why, why is that mechanical? It's because like, I think about that moment, the moment of like, when, when do you need this book? Um, in, you know, COVID, I'll give you a stat about publishing that so, somewhat relates. Um, in the kids world, uh, COVID hits, everybody goes in their homes, and you want to know the books that like exploded, absolutely exploded in 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 necessity. And Inside in info here, come on. Sure. Workbooks. Workbook. I mean, it's simple. This is super easy. Uh, yeah. Activity books and workbooks, like books with mazes in them, books that children <laughs> sit and look at and do things with that isn't destroying your couch. Like quite literally, just just sit here, go through this workbook, please. Uh, those books. Wow millions, millions of millions. And suddenly like we, we realized, oh, oh shoot, when you don't have school, educational books become really important, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a truism. All right, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, but when you don't, when you don't have beauty in your life or when yeah. you don't have agency at your job or when you don't have any sense uh, of what is going on, then suddenly, a murder mystery where there's a whole lot of sense is is necessary. Suddenly, a book uh, that is competence porn of this like Jason Bourne going around being having the most agency you can have. He's quite literally an agent. Um, mm -hmm. Feels great. Suddenly, when you don't have beauty, uh, poetry of of the uh, 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 of the natural world is necessary. Yeah. Okay. So then, those, that's interesting. And then what do you grab for, right? So I, I build from that moment. And as a result, um, uh, uh, well, as a result, I, I think of it as almost a blue collar, no color methodology of justifying text, right? And then of course, I put a lot of blame on everybody else for uh, just watching too much garbage and not having a curatorial decision in their body and deciding to no longer read uh, critics, and then I blame critics because none of them have the credibility to tell them to force a conversation, to demand, uh, to you know, in the world, uh, acknowledgement that something that just came out was good, right? We don't have that credibility anymore. So everywhere in the ecosystem, you know, uh, you know, things fell apart. But 
the, what the artists didn't do was stop was keep making necessary work. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I don't even know what your yeah, question is. Yeah, well, was. it's funny <laughs> because you you mentioned something. I actually was talking to somebody today, and I had to use uh, the phrase "the ambush of beauty," uh, mm. because I mean that's kind of what you're saying. We sure. art is necessary, but even though it seems kind of useless and frivolous, and we we don't know how to curate it, but well, until you need it, something right? about it that can give you as that moment you're talking about. You're looking for that moment, and that's where the real power of it is, and it, that's why it, it's so wonderfully dangerous. Because yeah, I mean, I, art broke. I mean, for my art, right, is is like can be broken down into ad, atomic subunits of metaphors, right? Yeah. Like the D, what is the DNA? Like, what are some of the subunits that build to become a story, and then also a novel? Let's start with just the, the unit metaphor. What is a metaphor? Like, really? Like, it, it's saying, like, uh, you know, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't like people who walk in and they, they walk in, um, they, you know, they walk in like they own the place. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. We all know what that means. I have now referred to something. There's a little sign right here that I hung between me and you. A phrase, a metaphor, you know, they, they, you know, and that's not my voice, simile, I know, but you stay with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they were walking, or, or this person, you know, like, you know, walked in, like they only place. Cool. Now you have a, per, a, a signifier in your head, and I have a signifier in my head, and we're fairly confident that we're, even though the two signifiers, your head and my head, are different, we're fairly confident that in the middle, they both match to this sign. And that sign is person who walks in like they own the place, right? Mm -hmm. it's actually different. Yours is different. There's no chance that if I could go into your brain and draw the picture of that person, it looks like mine. There's just zero chance. The probability is too small. And so, uh, so then, wow, metaphors do something neat, don't they? Mm -hmm. They actually have, are a completely unstable uh, sign system that allows me to translate into your head something I, I want. I'm, I have decent control over. Um, but that I have no ability to actually control, right? So, uh, so that's like the basic unit, right? And what is that when we think about like um, we're animals in the world and the world is super com complex and it has things in it that are like way, way above our understanding, right? Um, and there's dimensions we don't understand. And there's like little moments between siblings that we really don't understand. And then there's like, there's love in there somewhere. And my gosh, and and all we have is here the, 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 these little rules of thumb, these little like units that we can use to actually build our understanding of the world, right? And the great books, this is what they deliver, right? We say so, to somebody is, um, yeah, yeah, you ever read Anna Karenina? Like she, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, <laughs> she, he's a little bit like Levin. And we're like, mm, I know what that means. I know what that, I know what that means. Or like, <clears throat> or Gatsby, Oof. yeah. I've met, I've met that. Like we all, we all know, we literally all know. These are, these are perfect like heuristics of how to go through life. This is what art delivers, right? So like, there's actually a deep necessity uh, for the unit of metaphor um, that we all, we all go through. Because otherwise, you would, you, I actually think what you would be is a lot like a rabbit. You would be a creature who is aware of how dangerous and terrifying and unknowable the world is and how large it is. And you would also be just aware enough to know um, how uh, um, vulnerable you are. <laughs> and the fact that you have zero heuristics, like zero rules of thumb to follow, to help you, means you are, you are that panicky rabbit that just like craps out a bunch of pellets and dies of a like heart attack the minute a car is coming or the minute like a light turns on on the porch. Why? Well, because you'd be aware, like you know, metaphors actually help us organize an unorganizable world. So like when I say it's necessary, I mean, it's like necessary for your life. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then, and then you have garbage, then you have bad art. But I mean, like, so don't, 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 this don't is do not that. an argument for everything. You know right. I, mean? I think there's definitely a, a t-shirt in there with that image of the rabbit and the light going on and and uh, spelling pe pe pellets yeah i think we got definitely not we're getting t-shirts and bumper stickers 
in this conversation. But that's what we are. Yeah. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel that way where you don't you don't have a uh, uh, so like you know okay so the in 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 like I don't even know which disciplines but like the term heuristics are come from like this notion that um, our brain is unable to process all the things all the time so mm -hmm. it runs these little algorithm it runs these little heur heuristic means like it's like saying a rule of thumb right so like when you're going through a really really difficult uh, maze or even like the dr driving you're like okay that sign means that always kind of do this you know you know what I'm saying. So it's these little pockets of um, sort of uh, behavior that you kind of just generally know. To, you know what's okay, cool. Do you ever run into a moment where you're just like, I don't, I don't actually, I've never had this happen to me before. Like it's, it's, it's weird. Like you know who writes about this a lot? Ian McEwen. So he has this great book called Great Love, where it opens in a park, and there's a there's a, a, a hot air balloon, and it's like lashed down. And there's all these kids playing. There's a kid playing inside the basket. And then um, all of a sudden the lashes like snap and everyone in the park, there are all these people in the park and they're trying to like hold it down, right? And, um, and it's, it's, and he's describing it so perfectly. And cause it's this moment of just like sudden horror of, oh my gosh, the balloon's leaving. They're all holding on to it. They're holding on to each other. And as little by little, everyone is slipping and they're, you know, and it's getting higher and they're falling off. And this one man holds on to like 200 feet. And, and he, unfortunately, his, his, he can no longer hold on. He, he plummets and there's that in this dead silence of the park, they just watch him fall 200 feet to his death. And something has happened in this moment, right? This is the first like 10 pages of the book. Uh, that that means that everyone in this park is utterly changed and has no concept of what in the world they just saw. Like it was random and weird and whose fault was it and what was it? And, and it has the size of life, you know, and the stakes of uh, death attached to it. And, and he does a really great job of then writing how that affects and like utterly changes um, the people involved. And some of it is because they can't fathom it. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, if you ever have that moment, then you kind of realize what the power and and uh, uh, necessity of some of, of, of art, right? I wonder how much maybe that has been stirred in the last six months, because there is sort of these things that we haven't been able to grasp in our current situation with Corona and COVID and and uh, the racial things and justice and things like that. I mean. We can't wrap all our minds around it, and uh, yeah. and yet here we are. We can't fathom it. Well, let me let me take you back to the book here, and uh, I wanted to ask you this question here. Um, uh, it's kind of a. It's related to uh, obviously the book is about your life essentially, and as a kid, and the observations, and the family memories, and the fam family members you're counting and and uh, and you mentioned your mom who we all if you saw the documentary we were introduced to and that's your mom is just wonderfully charming and uh but um what's interesting is that the entire book seems to revolve around as the documentary points out basically a hard decision or a decision mm -hmm that it was one way and then it became completely another. And uh, I wondered, because we're in a current moment in our culture where we seem to not want people to make those kinds of things or even consider those things where it's like a change in decision or change, even just a slight change of mind, you know, even having a conversation seems almost um, militant. And yet here's this book that you're writing about where your mom makes this significant decision now, and this could be applied. I mean, it was a religious decision. She was a Muslim and she believed in Jesus. And there are all kinds of those levels of decisions that we make as human beings. And I just wondered, um, is this kind of like you working out the impact essentially of that decision uh, of your mom making that that choice that was that unstoppable choice as the documentary she's unstoppable 
Yeah, so that is that is absolutely the central, like if you were a writer, we'd say like the inciting incident, right? The, the thing that explodes that we then watch take its kind of arc across the horizon, right? Is is my mom. Um, to sort of take you back, I, I, you know, I don't assume that everybody kind of knows, so I'll kind of quickly explain Do um, it. what it is. It's an autobiographical uh, novel about what you just described. My, um, it's sort of got a short version and a long version, just like, um, I would have to sort of explain when I was a kid, right? When I was a kid, people would ask me what in the world I was doing in Oklahoma. And, and I would sort of answer that, well, my my mother had converted, and she was a very devout Muslim uh, and converted to Christianity um, while we were in Iran. And so um, she then joined the underground church um, and then finally fell afoul of the secret police, right? They're the secret police as a, very ominous name, they're called the committee, right? The comité is actually how you say it in Farsi too. Um, the comité are, are a not to be trifled with group of individuals mm -hmm. who uh, who sort of uh, capture my mom and interrogate her and threaten her to kill her and her kids. Um, so uh, so that day I got home from, my, my father drove us, uh, brought us home from, uh, I was in kindergarten and my mother was uh, was 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 in a was in a panic, um, and we realized that we would have to escape. So my uh, my father chose to stay in Iran while my mother, my sister, and I uh, became refugees and uh, went to the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, or Dubai, as um, you know, and specifically Dubai, um, which is one of the. It's like UAE is made up of principalities, and Dubai is one of them. So. Um, so we, we went there and effectively became refugees at that point um, because my mother sort of had what we colloquially in the West say had a fatwa on her head, which is to say, um, you know, she would have been put to death. And so we were in hiding and um, and finally sort of were, were kept, go, you know, we were applying to asylum to either Australia or Canada or the UK or the United States. And um, in the meantime, we were given uh, entry into a refugee camp in the outskirts of Rome in a little town called Mentana. Um, until finally, we did get asylum to the United States uh, and, and were in, uh, landed in Edmond, Oklahoma. So um, that is where we landed when I was seven years old. And, and so the story is fundamentally this arc, but anytime I begin to tell the story, the very first questions are, okay, why and how? And why, how, how did anybody do this? Why would she do this? Mm -hmm. And um, my mother will sort of very puckishly <laughs> look at you and be like, cause it's true. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, mom, <laughs> that's great. Uh, my friend in New York would like to answer, would like a slightly different answer. You gotta, gotta get, and, um, and so, because, because it's not, that is, that is the answer you give because because love knows reasons that reason knows not of, because mm -hmm. I, because it's my heart and it isn't accountable to you. Yeah. Like it's fundamentally what my mother, I mean, she wouldn't say it that way, but yeah, that's what it is. Um, but you know, you have to, you have to explain it. But to explain it, you got to go back. You have to go all the way back to explaining the distinction between Sunnis and Shi'is, like literally after the prophet uh, Muhammad dies, right? You have to explain that because mm -hmm. it's actually quite important to the story that we were in a Shi'i country, right? Um, you have to explain my mother's mother's mother and how she, you know, was the daughter of a gentleman farmer who owned a lot of saffron fields. And, and the fact that he disappeared caused this ripple effect where mm -hmm. he disappeared right after World War II broke out and he was in Azerbaijan um he was in the sort of tending to the saffron fields um he doesn't make it back and so my great great grandmother's um uncles come they take the farm they they marry her off the fact that she gets married off leads to another thing which leads to another thing right mm -hmm. and and so it becomes this like large epic story of four generations in my family um, and it's all kind of pitched as the story that this narrator is telling it to right. his classroom. Um, they don't necessarily believe him uh, because as with all our family stories, if you go far back enough, um, you kind of hit into the land of mythology, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's a phrase that says, it says the distinct, the, the, the distance between the land of our history and the land of storytelling was just 10 feet of fog. 
Um, Cause there's no telling where these things began. Like it's really interesting in, in is it Iceland? No, Nordic. In the Nordic histories, it's really funny. You're like, you know, as with all countries, their royalty has it's been pretty well recorded, right? So you get these like this king and King Newt and to this guy and to this guy. And then, um, and then there's like a moment in the history writing where it's like it's very serious it's very you take it seriously you're like okay he lived like 40 years that's believable like you know some crops failed okay cool and then you get to like it's literally there's no there's no space break he just goes to and this one and he could tell the ocean what to do and you're like wait i think we just i think we just left what just happened like the Nord, i don't think the nordic kings could ever tell the ocean what to do but you kind of you, so then how far up are you going to go before you're like History starts here, mythology ends here. I, I don't know, they don't know, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true with our family. The same is true with everybody's family, right? But like, um, and it kind of, there's my best example of like that land of a middle spot is is on my father's side, um, who, you know, my father's father owns a, owned a, past, a lot of land uh, in an area of Iran called Ardistan, really beautiful area. And um, so, so much land, I should point out that like you go back three generations and it's like the king of Aristotle, right? Like, like as a, as a re its own region. And we always ask like, how did he have all that? Like, how did, how did all this happen? And the answer is quite literally, well, he was a doctor and the king of, of like the Hindustan, like a, um, had, a, um, had a daughter and she was plagued by what, in these descriptions always come off as like schizophrenic um, episodes. And, um, and he went as did many other doctors and he diagnosed her and gave her uh, some sedative that, you know, helped her quite a bit. And so the King in his gratitude gave him his weight in gold and his weight in jewels. And he came back and he bought all that land and like, okay. Like, I, I it's not like the thing, that kind of thing didn't happen. Like, right. I mean, it's a, there were kings. We are certain of this. They did give people who did nice things for them money. Also, schizophrenia is like kind of an obvious problem to have. Like you, you, you know, it's physical. It's, it's, it's and and sedatives have been available forever. I mean, not forever, but certainly well since the great Persian Avicenna. Uh, some people claim he's not Persian, so don't. If you record this, don't come after me. Anyway, I'm taking him. Avicenna, I'm taking. Him. He's the godfather of uh, pharmaceuticals. Anyway, my point is this: sedatives existed, doctors existed, kings existed, schizophrenia existed, and gold existed. So, what's the problem? You don't believe it? <laughs> like, I, don't, I, I mean, I, to be very clear, I should point out, I have no idea if it's true. I, I don't know. Yeah, but. I know I was told this. And in the book, this is one of the big themes is uh, the, the nature and the, the sort of uh, difficult problem of not only your own memory as a story you tell yourself, but the family memory as mm -hmm. the stories we tell each other. Um, this is, I think, somewhere in that land, it somewhere it's gotta be in the middle, right? Like there's, maybe it wasn't a king, I don't know, um, but uh, but I've always loved that story, and I do. And I, and for what it's worth, I, I came down. I did some, I did some research, <laughs> and uh, it seems it seems actually fairly believable um, if you don't imagine magic carpets taking him to Hindustan, right? Like, so there's you know, no, there's no recorded history then of of. Uh, some sure, of there's recorded history. My dad will tell you. Uh, I we have a totally that we have a recorded history of everyone I uh, am begot begot by all the way to Shem. It's on a goat skin in my father's land. What are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do with that, Kirk? All the way to well, Shem. The son, let me be clear. The Shem. The, Shem, Noah's the son. son of Noah. I should have been. <laughs> I should have been clearer. Well, I mean, I mean, he will literally say this, and it's not. I mean, I don't. I mean, I was about to say, and it's not improbable, but it is improbable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually distinctly improbable. Well, we could we could play, you know, <laughs> C.S. Lewis is the great knock his mentor and say, well, it could be true. It could be true. It could be true. I, I honestly, I don't know. Here's the thing. Do you, I mean, here's the thing. I don't know. I don't know how much I care uh, in the sense that I'm not going around trying to like, I don't know, like Shem didn't leave me anything in a, in a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Safe deposit box. So there's no real material change yeah. to this scenario. And also right, like, right, right. 
I'm not going around like acting, you know, I think, I think the real question is, yes, where is that line? It is 10 feet of fog because for what it's worth, at some point in this document, it goes Masood, my dad, Hosro, me. Yeah. Well, we can, at least we can verify up to three, right? And then my dad could verify two further back and his dad could verify two further back. Star stuff, stuff gets fuzzy after that, right? Well, we got to look for the goat skins in other parts of Iran and see if they would confirm that. Yeah, so there you go. There you are. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated that I'm actually able to sit down and talk with a descendant of Shem here. <laughs> By the way, I have no idea if it was Shem. I, like he will say to the sons, I don't listen. Sometimes I'm not listening <laughs> when my father is talking on the phone. But it's interesting as you were, you were I just talking, mean, yeah, like, yeah. You, the, uh, the idea of not just, the, it wasn't just, I mean, the decision of your mother, which was a major decision, but yeah. there were a series of decisions, even in the stories that you were telling that seemed to, or, and even not just decisions, but circumstances that took place. Like your great, great grandfather went to Azerbaijan for the saffron fields. Well, that was his decision. It wasn't necessarily to the fatwa on him, but yeah. it, it significantly impacted your family's life. And But it's interesting though, that we don't seem to, have our current culture as we have it right now in America, where we could actually seriously be okay with discussing these types of serious things, serious decisions, or even without really getting mad at each other and starting to throw stones or whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, they're terrifying, right? They're terrifying and they have a huge, I guess you'd say a moral valence, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think, I think one of the better, you know, the tougher ones is like, okay, my father chose to stay. This is, of course, a decision. It yeah. has some complexities that, you know, I don't need to necessarily go into, but there is an interp there are interpretations on both sides, even within my family. Mm -hmm. There are interpretations. We do not agree whether this was uh, a fundamentally, let's say, heroic thing to do. Um, even within our, you know, a family, you can disagree on the, the morality of a particular um, decision or, you know, a moment. We are, we're tested by these kind of moments, right? And then we sort of like live through them. I really, I do feel that, um, you know, uh, there is, it is not sort of a steady line here, right? Like there are these, there are these moments uh, in your life where you are, you're sort of very clearly, like your metal is tested. Mm -hmm. um you know it's it i don't think it's as often it's as it's as sorry it's as like stark as hey you're 30 something you just started a medical practice and your wife uh is pa literally packing her bags when you get home <laughs> because because she converted recently mm -hmm. and is leaving the country are you going or aren't you um and you you know you take care of your parents you are you know uh there are there are lots of responsibilities though of course your your wife and your children um you know for most people is sort of like you know first and foremost these kinds of things so um that's a really really specific very black and white test right it's like you did it or you didn't mm -hmm. um that said again this is an extreme example to help us look at the less extreme in the range we are there are moments where you you really could get up and leave that gig and that would have been the moment or you really could, you know, um, take take things a different direction. And, and then we spend months, sometimes years, sometimes decades parsing through the results and the rabble of, of our decisions, sometimes destructive ones. And of course, you know, the interesting thing is how, how uh, you know, like, okay, so like nobody, no crowd, this is going to be a maybe a busted metaphor, but no crowd ever gets together to watch the, five months that it takes to build uh, a building, <laughs> right? But a crowd gathers the day we're gonna have a controlled demolition of the building because the city needs the lot, right? Like that destruction takes no time. Construction, like creation takes forever. Mm -hmm. So the decision to create something, the decision to build something is such a, is, a, you know, I guess if I was trying to build this out, this schema, this idea of art, I would say the decision to build something is such a daily ritual and such a um, discipline. I would literally, it's such a discipline that it's actually in the moment uninteresting. In the moment of every morning waking up and writing 10, 10 words or a thousand words is fundamentally like not 
what someone wants to watch and shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, results in, you know, an act of creation, whereas, uh, you know, destruction or, or a destructive decision seconds. Uh, or, or, or glancing over to the building every once in a while and say, oh, it made progress today. I mean, that's yeah, part. Sure. Not, you're not you're not there getting a lawn chair out in a, in a yeah, mic guy and, to watch, know, watch the slow watch, progress. Go, oh, look what they're doing today. <laughs> yeah. But you'll watch, you know, oh, they put another few stories on it. I mean, sure. I remember watching that, but yeah, you're right there. The interest level is different. Oh, so here's my last uh, question before the break here is you were talking about parsing through some of those things. Do you feel like with everything sad that that was kind of part of you parsing through some of these some of these things and that you've basically had to live with since you were what five Six, five yeah, yeah. and uh, obviously you're not going to parse everything but you know yeah this is a very this is a very good parsing i mean <laughs> many people on the on this call would uh, agree that this is a very good parsing so thank you uh yeah so um well, yes, the short answer is yes. If you're asking, did, did, was I, you know, so one of the themes that comes up in this book, right? And I, I'll, I'm gonna come around to this question because it's exact, I, it answers it, but stay with me. Is uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, people will joke, they'll be like, gosh, like, you know, you've got these big epic thoughts of like saffron fields and, and two, you know, major religions and fathers and, and mothers and real. Um, and then you've got a lot of poop jokes, <laughs> like a lot of poop stories. And I finally, by the way, finally, I was in an interview like a week ago and someone asked a serious question about the poop. And I was like, and I literally, I said to her, I was like, thank you. Thank you for being the first, for, for asking about this because, because it's actually very meaningful to me for multiple reasons. Well, it, we can get really heady about it. And there's a really great book called Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, where he, there's this really interesting scene where the main character Salim Sinai is looking out this window and out of the window, he sees a, a, a like a, a homeless man um, uh, squatting right there in public, defecating. Um, and, and he sees him, this, this it's like a crazy old like homeless guy and um, sees Salim looking at him as, and, and, and he starts laughing and he says, I used to make them this big. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is a, it's just a, it's a, the scene is hilarious. The scene is hilarious because it, it really, it sounds like a fish story. And it also sounds like the way that men talk to each other in locker rooms of like, like he's like, the, you know, the modern, in modern terms, he's like flexing, you know, he's like, he's talking about like his, 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 uh, uh, his ability. <laughs> abilities, right? Yeah. And Sinai, <laughs> interestingly, doesn't laugh this off, like is rather, rather wistful. Like as a character, he's like, kind of made to think about his own mortality uh, in this moment. Well, uh, and so I, I thought a lot about that scene and I thought also a lot about um, the nature of, of people in, in specifically in my life. And one of the main themes that comes through is um, what we produce, like our production, like literally the like the, and, and that people, uh, humans, anything, um, are really are able to be animals in this life. They really are able to just be a big old worm that does not a lot more than take in food and put out garbage, put out, uh, put out a lot of poop. Um, and that's basically all they produce. Um, and then of course, there's this really difficult thing to do. And then there are, by the way, there are people who do this in the metaphor, who take in a whole lot of pain uh, and then metabolize it and put out a whole lot of pain. Um, and then there are people who, and I would put my mother in them, among them, who are able to uh, take in an extreme amount of pain mm. and do something. There's some, there's some transformative lower intestine no mm. matter, uh, behavior that fundamentally turns that pain into, into kindness, into goodness, into, um, into some form of stopping this this behavior um and and of course uh it speaks to people who i think um to take this and pro like what you were saying like parsing who who want to parse um maybe the chaos mm -hmm. of their experiences and produce art um yeah. 
and and so that that's kind of like the theme of production the theme of like it's not just there to like be funny like i don't i don't just write poop stories because i'm like giggling while i'm also trying to tell you the story of my family um it really is it starts to I, you know to me anyway um starts to build slowly that metaphor of art being um the hardest thing to produce uh in a life uh like this one like re really um sitting down um it's quite easy to deliver um material it's mm -hmm. quite easy to deliver material that passes on chaos it's quite easy to deliver material that um reflects the ugliness uh that one has had to endure mm -hmm. it's really easy to create material that um that imposes more lies into the world it is very, very difficult. And that's that's why I, I would hope, like, and I say this, like, this is, ugh, I, I don't know if I did this. Uh, and I would never, I would hope the, uh, the room would be uh, gracious with me. Because um, I'll sort of admit my fear would be that it, this was just like catharsis for the self. And to do that, like, I think there's a lot of art that you're watching someone work out their demons on the page right right like they were watching and they never get anywhere they just basically delivered for you their demons mm -hmm. and you're like mm, thanks yeah. listen i gotta I, i'm carrying my own weight so you go ahead and stay there uh so that that is a terrifying thing to do uh now i guess i i owe people refunds if that's what i did but um my goal well, was very much to do the opposite i don't yeah i think you succeeded so um Take it. no refunds allowed the, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that I, uh, that. I, I actually the publisher gets it. <laughs> I'll say it again. I think you ha definitely have succeeded, and uh, this is this is good poop. Good <laughs> 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 poop. poop. So, oh, um, that's a good quote. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna end at, and pause for the moment and uh, uh, take a, a break and end the, the live. And then after a few minutes, we'll go into the Q&A that we can interact with Daniel. I'm sure you've got lots of questions about bumper stickers and t-shirts and the ambush of beauty and poop. And uh, we will we'll be excited to get to that. Thank you all who joined us on the live Facebook. And uh, we'll hope to have more of these maybe in this format, maybe in another format in the future. So uh, I will, uh, stop the stream and we'll go ahead and mute and i'd say give me about three minutes or so and i'll be back so thank you <laughs>